Good afternoon. Thank you for spending a little part of your afternoon with us. As I always say again, even those of you who have to, uh, we appreciate you taking the time out to visit. This is the last and climactic session of the uh, Sports and the LGBT Experience Conference here at the University of Southern California's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. Uh, and we, I have two introductions to make, and then I'm going to let everybody else do all the work, and I'm going to go back and be, uh, be very entertained, I hope. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce our co-directors for this program. I don't think we've ever officially introduced them in mass before, and so I want to bring them up here and introduce them, and then I'll let them take over. Uh, Evan Brody is a PhD candidate with the get up here. No, you can't. No, no hiding. Uh, is a PhD candidate with the University of Southern California's Annenberg School for Communication. Uh, he has done a significant volume of research in uh, LGBT issues in sports, uh, and he is co-directing this with Adam Rogers. Come on, Adam. You guys suddenly turned shy on me. <laughs> Adam Rogers, who is with the USC Lear Center, who have been very supportive of all of this effort. And we want to thank the Lear Center and Marty there for uh, all of your support and help, and especially for Adam here, who we have stolen away from you briefly and will try to steal more in the future. Uh, they put together an outstanding program. It's been very exciting and very enjoyable. I've really appreciated all of the very interesting panels they put together. And today we have a big blast off finish, uh, and then I believe, and then immediately afterward there will be a reception up in the East Lobby upstairs. So we'll look for you at the reception. But for now, I'm going to give this over to Adam and Evan and let them uh, bring this pony home. Uh, thank you, Dan. We also just want to take a moment to thank Dan for all of his support, not only for the conference, but also to sports scholarship here uh, at USC and to starting the Annenberg Institute of Sports, Media, and Society. Uh, also to John Hackett, who I, I don't think is here, but is uh, the program coordinator and does an immense amount of work, so the conference definitely wouldn't have happened without him. Uh, other than that, my only job here was to let you know about the reception, which you know about now, at 3.30 uh, up in the East Lobby. So we hope you all will join us. Um, and thank you again all for coming. We really Really appreciate all the support. Uh, we've had great attendance this week, so thank you. You guys, there's so many amazing people on this stage who I've looked up to for such a long time. I'm trying hard not to be a fanboy, but it, just seeing them all in one place is pretty incredible. So you are in for a treat. Uh, I am uh, here to introduce our moderator. Um, Kate Fagan is from uh, ESPN.com, ESPNW.com, and ESPN the Magazine. Uh, she recently gave just an incredible interview with Brittany Griner uh, uh, for ESPN the Magazine, and uh, previously she covered the Philadelphia 76ers uh, for the Philadelphia Inquirer, and she played basketball at the University of Colorado and professionally uh, in Dublin, Ireland. So please welcome our panel and Kate Hagan. All right, thank you. This panel is professional sports and the LGBT experience, and we could not have a better group here. Um, I know in the last few years, we have made so many strides in the conversation and dialogue we have around these issues, LGBT issues in sports, and a lot of that groundwork was laid by the folks we see sitting here. So I'm super excited. Um, but of course, there is still so much more work to do barriers we have to break down, conversations we need to have, and I'm hoping today we keep having those conversations. I would love if the panelists could introduce themselves, just because I find that they usually know what's important about themselves way more than I do. So Wade, if you could start, that'd be awesome. Okay, um, hi everyone. Um, again, thank you to Adam and to Evan for putting this on. Um, Evan's actually a friend of mine from the New York Gay Flag Football League. Hey girl! Um, <laughs> Um, but, um, and I'm excited to be up here with some individuals who, I, who have inspired me and keep ins inspiring me. But what's important about me is I'm the new um, executive director of the You Can Play, a project that does work to end homophobia in sports. I also uh, started a sports camp for, for LGBTQ youth um, that allows them access to sports and also workshops on leadership, anti-bullying, health and wellness, and social justice. 
Got to follow you, huh? <laughs> All right. I am Lauren Lappin. I was a 2008 Olympic silver medalist with the softball team. Um, and I am very excited to be up here with all of these amazing athletes and Kate. Former. Former athletes. Shame. Amazing athletes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. In her own right. Um, and to discuss these issues and um, be inspired and hope, hope, hopefully create some amazing dialogue. Hello, uh, my name is Billy Bean. Uh, I'm a Southern California guy. Went to uh, uh, Loyola Marymount University, graduated from there. I played Major League Baseball from 1987 to 1996 for the Dodgers, the Padres, and uh, Detroit Tigers. And now I, I live in Southern California. I'm the Vice Chairman of the Stand Up Foundation. And uh, I, too, am glad to be here today and appreciate the opportunity to speak with everybody. Aloha, uh, my name is Desera Tuaolo. Uh, I played in the NFL for nine years. Um, I'm very excited to be here um, and not six feet under. <laughs> uh, I am uh, a proud father of two beautiful children. Um, I, I have my twins, Michelle and Mitchell. Um, it's, been a, it's been a long journey and it's, 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 it's absolutely am amazing. Um, I also have this foundation called Hating Any Form is Wrong. Um, and we go around the country and we speak on homophobia in sports, but we also do an anti-bullying program. Um, I'm an executive chef, and uh, I'm, I have a single out, I sing, so I, I do everything. But uh, one of my passions is this, this, making a difference, educating people, and, uh, and this is what I love to do. Yeah. I think you can see why we're all so excited to have everyone here today. And we have so much ground to cover. Um, but to start off, I wanted to ask each of the panelists just to describe their experience during their playing days, just because I think it will help provide a framework for our discussion so that you each know where each one of these folks is coming from in their own personal experience. And Billy, I want to start with you because I think 1987 bring us, brings us yeah. the farthest back. Before these guys were born. <laughs> um, that is bad. <laughs> well, I think what's the most important thing to understand is that everyone's experience and journey is different. Um, no matter what, uh, where we are, or where you were, where your comfort level, and your journey of coming forward, or whatever it is that you're hiding, whether it's a, you know, abuse in the home, or, or financial issues, or uh, whatever it is. And, and for, but for me, I was in the closet in my entire career. I didn't come out until about two and a half years after. So I was never subjected um, to that type of ridicule, I submerged it uh, pretty successfully. I was raised in a family with five boys. My dad was in the Marine Corps and a police officer in Santa Ana, California. Um, I was the oldest. I never met a gay person before I went to college. I wasn't on my radar screen. I was the quarterback of the football team in high school for two years. You know, I just had girlfriends going up and, and I think because of my environment that I was raised in, um, I was able to push it down farther and farther until I think one of the common things you'll hear today is that as we became adults and as we became more successful in sports, you start getting out there, traveling, big cities, you spend a lot of time by yourself. And that, for me, once I got out of that structure, I was able to start understanding myself and my truth. And I got married on Loyola's campus, you know, a year after I graduated when I was a member of the Los Angeles Dodgers because I saw everyone else getting married. So it was, and I had never been with a guy before that time, so I thought I couldn't be gay. And I think what my experience after I came out and what I've been trying to share um, is the, the stories that inspire me, the bravery of kids your age, maybe even younger than you now, that are finding out, understanding who and what they are, their gender identity, their sexual orientation. Uh, there's so much more information at everyone's disposal. And along that comes with that are family issues, conflicts, and also bullying kids who are unafraid to be who and what they are. And sometimes you just can't disguise it. I think the fact that we were athletes, we were all disciplined, we were fortunate enough to have great coaching, um, and opportunities, and I never stepped outside of that structure, and that's the way I was able to play up until my 10th year uh, in Major League Baseball, and um, it really wasn't until my own partner died while I was a member of the Padres 
in his 30s that my armor started to crumble. And I, my parents didn't know that I was in a relationship. I didn't have any gay friends. I didn't go out to bars. Um, and I was sort of left with the wreckage of secrecy and the lies that um, I had been telling for years to try to just cover up the truth. And uh, that pushed me out of baseball on my own terms, I guess. You know, I wasn't forced out, I wasn't cut or released. And that was one of the great regrets of my life, so. I think you're next up, Esra, on the um, professional oh. career playing list. <laughs> my, uh, my experience was fabulous. <laughs> I mean, I had all the support in the world. <laughs> People were like patting me on the back when I went to the Super Bowl, like, congratulations. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was absolutely horrible. Is that what you want to hear? It was. Not only because I was living with this crippling secret, but having to, um, having to play in such a masculine environment and hitting, hearing all the homophobia in there, faggot, queer, homo, the jokes. Um, it was very, uh, it was uh, for myself, you know, I, I would tell people that, um, or tell kids that um, when I was a young kid, um, I heard, um, I saw my friends teasing this kid on, on the playground, calling them, you know, calling him Faka Latif, you know, Mahu, uh, you know, and, and I asked my friend, what, what are you doing? Well, he likes, uh, he likes boys and he likes playing with his sisters and stuff. And, and that is the day, uh, young ladies and gentlemen, when I saw a little bit of myself in that in that little child that they were beating up, spitting on, and, and, and calling names. Uh, so that is the day I put that child in the closet. Uh, and every single time um, I thought that I could bring out that child, I would hear something or I would see something that would, that would put me further and further into the closet. It was horrible because I was, living, I, was, I was living with anxiety, I was living with suicide tendencies, I was living with depression, I was living with blackouts. And, I was, it was, and, and knowing that every single day that I went into my locker room, the team's locker room, and I was not supportive, supported by anyone, it made it very difficult for me. But this is what the driving thing was for me. The driving thing was for me is that I came from a very poor family. I'm the youngest of eight children, so it was a way for me to deal, uh, to give back to my family. So that's why I dealt with all the stress and everything of, of playing in the NFL. So every single time the topic of homosexuality would come out in the locker rooms or wherever, it was always negative. I would see fist fights. I would see people arguing. It was just not a pretty arena when I played. Now, it's, uh, it's absolutely amazing because never in my world would I have thought that a player, a current player, would step up to the plate for me. You know, Chris Cluey, who's a good friend of mine, Brandon Ambedejo, who's a good friend of mine. It just, it, it, was, it, was, it felt amazing when they did that. Um, so we're definitely living in different times. I can I ask this question? Who knows, uh, how many of you in this room knows a gay person? Please raise your hand. Right? Ask that question 10 years ago, maybe 40% of you would have raised your hand. But anyway, um, my, my time in the NFL, professional football, um, all those years was absolutely something that I would not wish on my enemies. But you know what? The smile on my face, I really, it really, I really mean this now. Before, I used to smile to hide the pain. So. Thanks. Wade, go for it. That was, um, that was breathtaking. Um, I grew up um, in the South, and um, I, I grew up understanding um, what it meant to be gay by playing a game as a kid called Smear the Queer. Um, so that was really my first understanding about what it, what it meant to be queer or, or gay. Um, and that's not to demonize the South, but where I grew up, the idea of, of being gay was definitely wrong. Um, I started playing the game of football from a young age and just really um, just fell in, in love with it. And no one ever told me you know, that I could be, be gay and play sports. Um, I just thought from over the, all the times of hearing what, it, what the, the typical narrative meant to be gay, I was like, well, hey, I'm not that, you know, so I can't be gay because I'm good at sports. Um, in high school, unfortunately, was really the first time I started to understand that I was a gay man, and um, I became, un unfortunately, a, a bully. I, s I spent all of my high school career really terrorizing anyone that I perceived as gay and or different. My, my college life was, um, was, was really the first time I ever had an experience with someone who was gay, and, and it was truly um, a, a, 
a scary experience because it was the first time that I knew that I couldn't tell myself I wasn't gay anymore. Um, I was fortunate enough to have just enough talent to make it to the NFL, and my NFL career was a little different from Sarah's because I'm a little, a little younger. Um, so I didn't hear much. A lot younger. <laughs> I just moisturized. That's all. Um, um, <laughs> Old enough to be his father. No, <laughs> I didn't hear um, as much uh, homophobic comments. Um, I, I did hear a lot of sexist comments. And um, there is a certain way that sexism and, and homophobia kind of lay on top of each other, um, which still make, make you feel uns unsafe to um, identify as, uh, as a gay male. Um, and I'm fortunate enough now to have the privilege to work with um, LGBTQ youth and really see um, true heroes and sheroes every single single day. And um, that's really been the impetus for me doing the work that I do now. Well, I'm the only female athlete up here. Well, you're an athlete. I keep saying that to you. It's okay. <laughs> she Panelist. is shady. I'm <laughs> the moderator. moderator. <laughs> um, so I think that I will add an interesting perspective to all the dialogue today. But my story is, um, first of all, I forgot to mention in my intro that I, I still play. So I play in the NPF National Pro Fast Pitch for the UCSSA Pride. Um, and it's a young, hopefully growing league. And um, I'll, I'll touch more on that later. But my story is that I never really thought about from a young age whether I was gay or not. I thought about the fact that I loved sports and I loved to be on the softball field and the soccer field and I, that was my first love. And as I uh, grew up and got into high school, that's when I started to realize that I was having attractions for other women. And um, But same as everyone can kind of touch on up here, that you just ignore it. And for me being a softball player, being a female athlete, one, but a softball player where the lesbian stereotype is so strong, that made me go into the closet further or ignore my true self for a lot longer than I, I wish that I would have. And um, so through high school, I, I had some experiences late in high school and um, with another woman and then I ignored it and I got to college and I was at Stanford University where there's, sorry, Trojans. <laughs> My uh, sister's fiance is a big Trojan fan, so we have good banter about that. He's sitting up here. But um, so I got to Stanford, and Stanford is the type of student and specifically student athlete where there are a lot of expectations and I, I lived my entire life with all those expectations whether they were put on me by my family, my peers or myself and so at Stanford um, I can remember figuring out that I was gay um, by, falling in like, by falling in love with my first love wh who was a woman and wanting to hide that um, and not wanting to let any one of my teammates know. I didn't want to let them down. I, didn't want, I was a leader on our team. I didn't want to let our team down. And I thought that that would cause that sort of thing to happen. Not to mention, not only in high school, but in college is when I heard a lot of comments and when I was started to be affected by comments like calling people dykes or teammates analyzing whether uh, opponents were gay or not. And um, so that, that made me withdraw more from, from wanting to be out and come out of the closet. And then I graduated and I didn't have the pressure of, of uh, my college team on my shoulders and, and I uh, was exposed to women who were older than me and had become more comfortable with their own sexuality and to see straight teammates accept that and, um, and to see that, man, this might be okay. I, c I can probably be myself. And um, so when I first came out, I came out to my family while I was in college, um, slowly but surely, mom and sister first, and then brother, and then my football coach dad was the one I was terrified of the most, but I came out to him last, and they all were, you know, took their time with it, but um, ha had accepted it, and then get to the 2008 Olympics, we're on tour, uh, leading into the Olympics and one of my teammates, uh, The Advocate magazine was writing an article on her being bisexual and they wanted a quote from a teammate. And I remember thinking about whether I wanted, she asked me to do that and I remember thinking whether I wanted to do it or not. And I was just like, you know what, this is important. This is, in, this is important. I didn't think it was gonna be that big of a deal at all. And um, the first question they asked me over email was, how do you do identify? Do I identify as straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender? And I, that was the first time where I had to say that I'm gay. First time I had to use the L word and say I identify as lesbian. And I remember sitting there at my computer being like kind of blown away and having to sit back like, okay, 
I'm saying these words, I'm not just saying them to anyone, I'm, I'm putting it out there in print. And I took that time, maybe 10 minutes, and then did it and said, you know what, I'm doing this for Vicki, I'm doing it for uh, the LGBT community and whoever can read this, whatever, it's, it's, about, it's about my teammate more than me. And then <laughs> at the big press conference at the Olympics in Beijing, I'm sitting there on the panel with my teammates and um, I'm a role player, I was a role player on that team, so not a star, not expecting anything, and we break out to do individual interviews, so I'm finding the you know, spot in the corner <laughs> against the wall where no one, I won't be in anyone's way, and I'm not even off the stage yet, and that's when I was approached by a reporter um, to do an interview. Miss Lappin, do you mind chatting for a few minutes? Sure, great, okay, this is unexpected. And then the first question he asked me was about my sexuality, and that was the gut check moment where I was like, okay, I did this for my teammate, but this is, this is the time where you make the decision whether to be your true self and to talk about it and to put your money where your mouth is or to retreat and say no comment. And in that moment, that's when I said, um, okay, let's do this. Yes, I'll do it. And the reporter was from the Orange County Register, so that football player, football coach dad that I had talked about before, that whose face popped in my head because it's the same newspaper that writes about his football team on a weekly basis. And um, I said, okay, let's do it. And my heart was pounding throughout the whole thing, but um, talked about being gay and what it meant to be a gay athlete at the Olympics, which I hadn't even put much thought into at that point. So I went home from that press conference and my parents were in Beijing and I said, man, huh, they know I'm gay, but they don't know it's gonna be plastered everywhere, so I need to have this conversation. And um, a lot of dialogue be within the family and between myself and my parents happened from that point on. And since then, it's, um, I would like to get more involved like these amazing men near me, but um, it's, it's been amazing even just through social media, Facebook. Um, I've gotten some hate, yes, but um, more often than not, I'm getting people who are like, man, this, changed, this has changed my life. This is, you've, you've inspired me, and just those words even. And seeing a Facebook message pop up and checking someone's birth date and seeing that they're like 15 years old, a time when I wish that I had someone telling their story to me so that I could relate and, and figure out my truth a lot earlier. So anyway, it's been amazing to kind of be my truth, be myself, and to be able to speak to people about it. And there's, yeah. there's my piece. Well, thank all of you. Thank you guys for sharing your stories. Um, I think one point I, we talked about before is the difference between a lot of times women's sports and men's sports and that um, in women's sports, it's like you're reinforcing a stereotype if you come out as, as gay, lesbian. In, in male sports, you're shattering the stereotype. And it's important to keep in mind that those two things come with entirely different pressures. Some overlap and, you know, I think today, too, we want to make sure that we're like looking towards the future, right? I think everybody up here is working hard because they want to continue to make change. and. I feel like, wait, I want to go to you first because you're, you're in it right now, the You Can Play project. And I want, mostly I, I, I want to know from you is like what, where the culture is now in, in the sports leagues that you deal with, what you think some of those, still bar those barriers still are. Um, um, what I'm finding is that most athletes, whether they're male or female, um, who identify as heterosexual, actually are much more welcoming to the idea of, of having an LGBT teammate. Um, I think that we have to do a lot of work to change that narrative that athletes are homophobic. Um, I think that if we start asking them, we'll see that they'll go, well, can this person actually play the game? And if they can, then great. If they suck, then I don't want them, which has nothing to do with <laughs> orientation or identity. Um, when Jason Collins came, came out, there was 400 plus athletes that were affirming, they were like, who cares? There was a, a, a splattering of athletes who were like, yeah, yeah, like, like who said a lot of negative stuff. But I think the problem that we're having is that the 400 athletes who are aff aff affirming to LGBT people aren't given enough media, aren't getting enough press. And we really have to make sure that athletes who are aff aff affirming and are open to the idea of, of having an, an LGBT teammate, that their stories are told more, you know, that, that we have to get young athletes to believe that sports is a place where they can actually exist in and that, and that it's, it's accepting. Billy, what's your experience in, in the work you do about where the sports <clears throat> culture is right now? Well, I think, uh, I, th I think we've hit that 
that point in history where politically correctness is is taken over, much like you know the way whether you are racist or discriminating kind of a person, you know publicly you have to talk a certain way, and that that started what 15, 20 years ago, or what, whatever, 25. So in sports, there is this general consensus of support. Um, I've met with the Dodgers and the Padres um, about. Uh, sort of like public relations uh, projects, you know, br pulling the community, creating a larger fan base. Um, we just did a big night at Dodger Stadium um, out at the ballpark. I threw out the first pitch. Um, there was probably four or 5,000 um, people that came as an LGBT group, um, sat all in the same section, you know, had banners and stuff. So it was really like, you know, what I commented was for one day we were all Dodger fans. So we were united by that as opposed to a bunch of gay people in section 25 and then a bunch of Hispanics in section 24 and you know, African Americans in 23, whatever. It's just, and that was, that was progress because I, when I was on the Dodgers, that didn't happen. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I was on the Dodgers um, the year that Tommy Lasorda's son died of AIDS and I did not even know that that happened. That's how the press covered up that salacious type of uh, uh, secret in those days. Um, I feel like we're we're getting very excited. There's a there's a, a groundswell of support for athletes. Um, we're ready to embrace them. I really wish Jason Collins would have come out ten days before the season ended last year and played mm -hmm. five games in uniform. I wish John Amici did the same thing. He could have done it as well. He was on a team that wouldn't have been affected. They chose not to do it, um, and then they had, and I don't know if they were advised. I'm very good friends with Jason. Um, I think the world of John. Um, I, m my part of the, the historical progression for athletes, I was before Sarah. Um, it wasn't possible for us to do that. I, I wasn't a good enough player. He, he was, but I, would, I literally felt like I would be released and cut the minute that secret came out. I was a journeyman outfielder living and dying each and every day on one-year deals for a decade. And, and so I wasn't comfortable with my sexuality enough to even think to tell my family, <laughs> let alone get behind a microphone and tell the Padres. So, but I think my experience led to his experience. Led, and Jason Collins said a wonderful thing in Sports Illustrated that he, he, he actually acknowledged this progression. And I think that each and every time, you know, Wade or myself or Sarah or um, the work I try to do is stand a foundation, which is an anti-bullying foundation, not even specific to LGBT kids, but obviously inclusive. Um, it's just trying to protect ki all kids who are bullied. But th the historical progression and how we are moving things forward little by little. Now, Jason Collins hasn't been signed to a contract yet, and we're sitting here wondering, he was on the cover of Sports Illustrated as the only openly gay male team athlete active, and it might not happen. Which would be devastating for me. I, he's, you know, he's in great shape. He's working out. He's hopeful. Maybe it'll happen, and it'll be a great day if it does. But that message is still resonating with all the guys that are in the closet in football. You know, there was a big rumor about Kerry Rhodes last year. You probably even know him. Maybe you know, great defensive back for the Cardinals. Rumors that he was gay. I don't know Kerry. I don't know if that's true or not. But next thing you know, he's getting engaged to a woman and he's out of football. Mm -hmm. And he was a very, I have a buddy on the Cardinals, he was a great player, he's all pro type. Um, so it's easy to generalize that the world's getting better because the, the world is getting better in every other arena. It doesn't mean that a kid who's out on the USC campus right now is not nervous about being bullied when he's walking to class by four or five girls together or, or four or five guys that are on the, football team or the swim team, who, whoever, you don't know. I'm just saying the reality for athletes, they're still watching and not seeing a consensus mm -hmm. progression. And to me, one of my best friends spoke on this panel, Kirk Walker, the coach of UCLA women's softball team, he's, to listen to the prejudice within girls softball, as a male team sports guy who knows nothing about that, that, I almost dropped dead in my tracks thinking, that would, seems like an impossibility because it was so commonly understood that if you were a lesbian in softball, nobody seemed to go, you know, step out of bounds or it wouldn't matter if you were going to be an All-American. It wouldn't 
hinder you from going to a great program in those in that context but it, it it's so real when you get behind the scenes and you need that camaraderie within a team and in team sports it's different than individual sports if she would have been the number one hundred meter runner for the united states she, it wouldn't it would have been a difference because she mm -hmm. had earned her way as individually but to work as a group to, to have NFL teammates embrace you and have your back. I mean, I want to Sarah to share some of the quotes that some of, a Hall of Fame wide receiver for the Green Bay Packers said about homosexuality when his story came out. It's, it's, it, it'll give you goosebumps. You remember Shannon? Oh, um, <laughs> Or Sterling, not Shannon. Sterling Sharp, yeah, yeah Sterling Sharp. Um, and that's... I, I, uh, Sorry, you know, with the whole head injury thing and stuff. Could you ask that question again? <laughs> like, Billy was no, referencing. You know, I get involved in the stories. And when you, like, when you came out, everyone uh, on ESPN was, it was Shannon, talking. Shannon? No, Sterling Sharp. Sterling Sharp. Yeah. What, um, what I found, um, uh, what I found, I, I've been doing this for the last decade and um, going out and speaking on homophobia in sports uh, with, athletic, uh, uh, with, with the athletic departments. And what I found out was that there is a lack of education but then there's also the fear of the unknown, you know, out there. I'm sorry, but if you don't think that you, you coming out, you probably surpassed us with, with your coming out with the Olympics and, and, and all the, the, the soft, girl softball or anyone that has to do with sports that, have, that saw your story um, worldwide, you have definitely surpassed us. So please, you have to give yourself a lot more credit than that because for me, anytime an athlete comes out, like John Amici or whoever, um, or um, John, I mean, uh, Jason, it is for me, I go automatically on how, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, how amazing is this? Because you know what? It just saved a, a, a couple more thousand lives. <laughs> that's, that's, I, it's so, for me, that's, that's where my mind goes because it, it's such a need for us in the, GL, uh, the GLBT community to have great role models that come out. Um, and it's just, uh, it was just so exciting that he did come out. You know, we, if you're in the GLBT community and you're out there and we all know it, we all go through the same thing. You know, stress is stress, pain is pain. We all go through the same things. It's the thing of um, having to be in a safer, safe environment where you can step out to your truth. For me, it was about my children, my two beautiful kids. We, had, we, had, we were finding it difficult to raise our kids in the closet, you know? And I tell you, when I said those words for the first time that Sarah Tuola was gay on, on, on Real Sports HBO, it was one of those most, the hardest thing I ever did in my life. Because here I was, 35 years of my life, I was in the closet, I thought I was alone on an island. And when I stepped up to the plate to swing, Man, that was so difficult. But let me tell you this, when I did, wow, it was so amazing because this mountain just crumbled, right? I felt light as a feather, but when I stepped on the scale, I was still 300 pounds. <laughs> I'm still 300 pounds, uh, 308 to be exact. Uh, <laughs> but the magnitude of me stepping out into my truth and being able to walk down with my children, oh my gosh, I'm gonna cry, no. No, I'm not going to cry. Um, <laughs> to walk down the street with my, my children and everybody know that we're a family was the most amazing thing. Yes, when I did come out, there was a lot of hate mail. It came, let me tell you, Shirley Sharp, a uh, good friend of mine came out and he's, you know, he, said some, you know, he said some things where if I would have came out while I was still playing, that I would have been cut or I would have been injured or I would have been hurt, which would probably been true. <laughs> what he was doing is just confirming everything that would have happened if I would have came out during that time in the good old boy sports, in the masculine gladiator sports, you know, where, you know, I played nose guard, so I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't this skilled position player where I could run away from people, no. Every single play, I got double teamed or triple teamed. So it would probably have been easy for somebody to take my, my legs out. And we know from, you know, from, you know, from the, uh, for the New Orleans Saints of all the bounties, how much you think it would be for the gay guy, right? <laughs> Right to take him out, and let me tell you this: I've dominated so many offensive linemen, and I have film to prove it. How would it have been and stuff if I if I came out if, and if and 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 dominated against uh, dominated an offensive lineman, and he would have been ridiculed by his teammates? Oh, you got beat up by the fag. <laughs> you but you know, it, it's it's one of those things where I um. You know, I I'm so glad that I am here today and seeing the progress of everything from when I came out before me, 
David Copay, who was supposed to be on this panel, uh, um, I think he has uh, an emergency. It's his book and his life story saved my life because I was about to kill myself that night. A friend of mine gave me his book, and it saved my life. And you know that's. And for me, that was the most amazing thing. So when you come out, or when you came out, or Wade, or all these other athletes, man, it is so important that we need to come out because there's so many kids out there that need to hear the story. So. Tough to follow that, but Lauren, I know Billy mentioned this, just the different pressures that female athletes face. One of them, we talked about this before, just this need to like hyper-feminize, to you know, not fall into the stereotype of the gay female athlete. I mean, what was your experience in that world? Did you sense those pressures? I absolutely sense those pressures, and I, I think that that's an issue that still needs to be overcome. I think that young softball players, young female basketball players, still face those fears of, okay, if I'm not, I know in our sport, if I'm not wearing a ribbon, <laughs> or if I don't have enough makeup on at our game today, or, or on a TV game, like, what's it gonna mean, you know? I remember in college, it's getting further away now for me, but it wasn't that long ago where we would say, oh, wear a ribbon today so no one thinks you're gay, you know, make sure no one even thinking you're a lesbian, you know, so um, I think that that's still very prevalent. And um, like you were saying, there's a, a blogger this year from a college softball player talking about kind of the protocol of your appearance and what that means and whether or not it means, yeah, to signify whether you're gay or straight, it certainly means to feminize yourself yeah. within the sport and within a sport that's that's thought of as being a very masculinized female sport and has always had the stereotype of being a gay sport. And um, so I know my experience, I, I remember going home for Thanksgiving from my freshman year and hanging out with some high school friends and some of my male friends and female. Oh, so are you, are you gay now? Are you gay now because you're playing college softball? I'm like, well, you don't even know how, how that struck me. But like, what does that even mean, you know? Uh, so I think that, that those were the kind of things that affected me um, as a player. Now I've coached at the college level, and I'm out doing clinics and camps with, with youth of our sport. And, and you, see, you see that, and whether they know it or not, um, you see, especially especially in certain pockets of the country, how how far we've come and how far we still need to go, specifically within softball. Um, so I, I do I am surprised at comments I hear when I'm out and about um, of 12 year old kids being perfectly okay talking about their gay teammate or or you know me being gay or any of it and I'm just like wow rolls off the tongue I should follow your lead you little mm -hmm. 12 year old you know and so should <laughs> so should all of the rest of the adults in our country but um, but then you you see the opposite too and well as someone who still plays and I'm assuming you do know some female athletes who are still in the closet what's your sense about what's keeping them there I think I hear a couple of different things. Um, I hear, well, everyone knows I'm gay anyway, so why do I need to make a big statement? And I can, I can relate to that and understand that, certainly. Um, and to, to, you guys touched on Abby Wambach earlier, and I think she's done a perfectly fine job of living her life, or being her authentic self, and putting her, her personal life out there as a gay woman without having to say, make this big statement. And I think that we're going to be living in a, in a great world when no one has to make the proclamation that I'm gay, you know. Um, but I don't think we're there yet. So um, I, have, yeah, I have teammates and opponents in the pro league, in national team programs, college softball that think, you know, I'm, everyone knows anyway, so why do I need mm -hmm. to say anything? And then I think that there are still fears. And I think that with our league, um, it's young, it's small, and it's growing, and we have a lot, a lot of other things riding on what we say and how we carry ourselves and how we represent ourselves as individuals, as teams within the league and as the NPF as a whole. And I think we fail, the NPF fails to reach out to a really strong fan base, the gay community. And um, because we're scared of being labeled as the gay sport still. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that if, from the top down, that's the biggest kind of difference that we could make uh, in, within mm -hmm. softball. Yeah. Wade, Billy, I mean, any of you guys, what do you, what do you hear is like the one barrier that's keeping 
male athletes? If there is one or if there's two, if it's a combination, the, you know, what is that one thing if you had to point to one or can you kind of give us a sense of what um, it is? For myself, I would say ideas of masculinity. You know, like what does it mean to be a man? You know, um, I think oftentimes we create these ideas of saying, you know, like in order to be a man, you have to, first of all, ob objectify women, right? Um, you have to, um, to identify as all these different, different things, and then that, that makes you a, a man. And for myself, I saw myself as a man, but then the idea that I was gay changed all of that. Um, so I think if we really re redefine what masculinity is, you know, then you'll have a lot of more, you, you'll have more ind individuals saying, hey, you know what, I can be gay and I'm still a man. So I think we have to do a better job of not having one specific type of gay man that exists out there. You know, if you watch a TV now, the stereotypical gay man is a modern family type. You know, um, there are very narrow representations of what it means to be a gay man, you know, and then um, in certain communities, you know, as a black man, you know, I felt a different pressure, you know, about what it, what it means to be black and to, and to be gay, you know. Um, so I, w I, w I would say that the first thing that I would attack is, um, is, ide is ideas of masculinity. Um, I think for me, it's still a matter of fairness and the fear that if you take on that reality or responsibility by telling the truth, every athlete is still worried, am I going to be given the same opportunity to succeed? Um, if you've ever been on a team and you were on the margin and you realize how hard it is to succeed in a team sport if you're not treated equally, you know, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. I, I think there's job security, that part comes into it, but at the end of the day, if you see an athlete someone on the Dodgers making, you know, minimum salary gets a base hit. He's on first base and he's got a big smile on his face. If you see a guy making 20 million a year in an 0 for 10 slump, he looks like he just lost his dog. It doesn't, it, the, the primitive nature of all athletes is to succeed because good things come from that. And if you, it's no fun to be on a team where no one wants to hang out with you. And, and it's not that that would be the case, but I think until that one person is in, in, that, in that environment and we see it um, and we all fantasize it being one of the top players in their sport, so it would just be a nice, easy transition. But I think um, I remember after my career was over, after my story came out, I was roommates with a guy named Brad Osmus for two or three years on the Padres. I, the Padres came to visit the Florida Marlins. I was living in Miami Beach. I was petrified to walk into that clubhouse as an ex-player on that team, and people know that I was gay. I had all my clothes on, I don't know those guys, but it was like, how are these guys gonna look at me? And I wasn't playing. And I, I'm not ashamed of my life. I had, a, you know, I've been successful out of baseball, but it just skewed the dynamic of our relationship just a little bit. And I think every guy in this room who's played on a team can understand what that might feel like and what keeps someone who loves being an athlete. We, he was a football player who happened to be gay. He wasn't a gay football player. You don't get to the NFL because you're special and have special needs or something, okay? Like, you are, you're good. I, I was, the first time I walked on a minor league baseball field, it looked like there was a thousand guys out there, okay? Like, it didn't seem possible, but they, they're cutting guys every single day. You know, you twist your foot the wrong way, you're gone in the NFL, non-guaranteed contracts, whatever. So at the, at the base level of whatever, whatever our progression is, an athlete wants to succeed. And that's why for me, um, I have compassion. I always have. I've taken a lot of abuse um, from my own community about understanding why athletes are hesitant to do so. No different than you know successful all-American players, whatever, Stanford, national championship years, year after year. Um, but for me, when someone is done playing or had the opportunity, like I mentioned about Jason or, or um, uh, John Amici, it feels like a missed opportunity because what he is saying about the, the positive effect it does have, and some kid who just made the, you know, the, the baseball team here at USC and he's a freshman and nobody knows his name yet, and he might be dealing with the same stuff I was dealing with, and he could go on to be a first-round draft pick. You know what I mean? This is what we're talking about. 
you only pay attention to the things that matter the most to you. And for 99% of the people in this room, this topic may not matter after this class is over for you. But it may matter to someone you love. It may matter to a family member. It may matter to your future son or daughter. It might matter to one of your parents. You know, it's, and when you lay, pull back the truth and you see, it, it's incredible how suppression of who and what we are. If you can imagine, you think, oh, it's no big deal to be gay or lesbian and be in a closet. If you're straight, imagine you having to be gay to make sure that your parents still loved you and wanted you to come home for Thanksgiving. Can you imagine doing that for a while? That's what every one of us did. We were brainwashed to think we were wrong by society, not by one person, but just, and, and this is the damaging effects. It may not seem possible that someone would want to kill themselves because their sexual orientation doesn't fit into the, the puzzle of life. But for someone like him, who is the, the leader of a family, a leader of a fucking island, basically, by his success, it, for him to come home, his family has to deal with him being out of the closet. His, his cousins, their kids, their kids going to school in Hawaii, there's a huge responsibility that goes with it. It's not just like all fun and games and circuit parties, okay? It's like lives are held in the balance. When you're a, a top-notch athlete and your family is watching you and the responsibility of her being on a, a U.S. Olympian, you know, it's a huge decision. And they're the wake of, of the people that live their lives through your success on the field. I, I don't know how many people are athletes in here, but if you are, you know what I'm talking about. And that's why the positive images, the positive role models, us talking, us talking to kids, it, it, it is important and it's, it's the reason why I'm here today. What were your? Oh, oh, no, you wanna, can, what can were I, your? Go, you want to respond to Billy? No, no. I, I just wanted to, um, to add my two cents and the yeah, whole cool. um, why I feel. And you know, I, I have spoken to a few uh, of my friends that are playing in the NFL. Uh, and and this is it. Even though we are living in different times, even though you know we have the support of of other athletes and, and people around and leaders, it's the thing that we don't have the stamp, that stamp of the NFL saying that they support us, saying that, that um, they're there for us. Because if, there's, if, if it doesn't come from you know, the commissioner educating the owners, owners educating the coaches, coaches educating the players, creating a, a safer environment for an athlete that's playing in the NFL to come out and feel comfortable, then they won't. They won't. And I'm, you know, yeah, John Amici I, you know, and those guys, I mean, they came out because it was their time to come out, right? I do believe that there will be a player that will come out while he's still playing in the NFL, and it's coming soon. It's definitely coming soon. But there's got to be a lot of education. There's got to be, got to, they have to see that support. If I saw that support playing, walking into that locker room, and if anybody called somebody a fag, and the coach stepped up to the plate and said, you know what, that's not tolerated in my locker room, it would have been, it would have made a huge difference for me, huge. And if I could feel this way and play, oh my God, sky would have been the limits. It would have been amazing. But I think there just needs, uh, they, the reason why is because they don't have that stamp. The NFL, this is their stance on it. And I found out from a friend. I, I, the, their stance is, well, they'll do something once somebody comes out. Then, they're gonna, then they'll jump on the bandwagon and then they'll do all that stuff. And you know, But why not do it now? <laughs> and make it a safer environment and educate all these idiots out there with the good old boy sports and let's have a heyday and a party, right? Hello, let's do it now. I mean, David Cope came out in the 70s, Roy Sims, myself. I mean, I mean, there's, there's, we're out there, we are there. So anyway, sorry. What were your thoughts last year when the news broke that there was gonna be a group of NFL players come out at the same time? Um, and for those of you who didn't know, I think Brendan. That was a lie, by the way, also. <laughs> no, um, when I came out, there was this guy that was promoting a book saying that he, um, there was a bunch of gay NFL players that used to meet. And I'm like, why wasn't I invited to that party? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, don't you think I would have known? I mean, and then it made me think, like, God, am I ugly? Or, <laughs> like, no. But, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean. To. 
I, but it's one of those, I, you know, when that came out, I, I didn't really jump on the bandwagon of that. Uh, but I, automatically, I went to my resources, and they said no. <laughs> but um, they, uh, so anyway, long story short, I didn't jump on the bandwagon. Now, for me, it's now it's you know you gotta it's, 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 you gotta you gotta step up to the plate before you, you know, before I believe anything. And just to comment onto that, um, one of the reasons why that announcement was so. Uh, problematic is that if anyone in here who's gay, when someone makes a proclamation that athletes are going to come out, that creates a witch hunt. So, so, so I have friends who play, and they're like, "What the hell is this person who's talking about?" Like, there is no group of athletes who are who are coming out. So, guys start taking down their Facebook pages, their Twitter accounts. They became hyper vigilant about what they were doing because of of this fear. So we have to be very careful to not make statements like that, especially if you're not gay and you don't know what statements like that do. Right. Exactly. I have a, a just a quick example. After my baseball career was over, I, I was in Miami Beach and I started a real estate uh, career. And Alex Rodriguez, uh, before all his uh, drama with the last few years. Uh, we, we became friends when he was a uh, Seattle Mariner and I was on San Diego Padres because we shared a spring training complex in Arizona. And uh, I was representing him and his wife in a real estate deal. And he called me and he said, hey, let's go grab lunch. I want to talk to you. And I told him, I said, listen, you need to bring your wife. This was like in 2002 or three. I said, if they take, if someone sees the two of us having lunch somewhere, you're going to be having gay rumor questions all night long, and it's going to happen tomorrow. And it was interesting because he was like, "Oh my God, I didn't even think about that." But he brought his wife just to be sure. And you know, I was worried about him being, you know, stereotyped or, or whatever. And it's interesting that. You know, like you said, when it made me think of it when you said people taking down their Facebook and Twitter. It, it stops people from spending time with their friends because, you know, if a football player is hanging out with way too much, people are going to talk because he's brave enough to live a life open. You know, same with the E. You know, baseball, my, I, my two best friends in baseball are probably Brad Osmus and Trevor Hoffman. Um, and they're two guys that literally, they're both married and got families, and they literally don't care. And... But they're done playing now, you know what I mean? And they have a lot of money in the bank, and it's, it's different. I think it's, they're kind of, they want, they like the, you know, bother me about it kind of thing. But if a player in the NFL, which is a much less secure sport than baseball, because they don't have guaranteed contracts, they don't sign players to these ridiculous nine or ten year deals like they do baseball players, um, they have job security issues every single day. And so it's a, it's a relevant, relevant uh, idea. Wait, when you when you guys sit down at the You Can Play project, what do you talk about? What, what are those conversations like? Um, we talk a lot about how do we impact the lives of young people. Um, we really believe that if, if you can get young kids to not use homophobic and sexist language at a young age, um, then that's really the foundation. You know, it's very hard to change a 40-year-old person's ideas around homophobia and, and sexism if they're just that, you know, if, you know, my mother, um, when I came out to her, was pretty horrific to me, you know, the, the second thing she said to me was, you're already black, you know, so she already had a narrative in, in her mind about what it meant to be, to, to be gay, and my, my mother came around because she, she knew me and she, she loved me, but I, my, my father hasn't. You know, because he's been that way for his entire life, you know. But so I think um, our biggest goal is how do we start with young people. And the, the You Can Play Project just signed a partnership with the Chicago High School Athletic Association to do education in 740 of every high school in, in Colorado. Like, that's how you, that's how you shift, shift consciousness is by starting with, with young people. Right now, we talk so much about gay and lesbian issues because it's like a hot topic within sports. Uh, how do we make sure we don't forget the T in this? So one of the things I say oftentimes is this LGBT sports movement is really a G movement. You know, honestly and truly, like, we don't do enough work ar around lesbian issues. We would never mention bisexual issues, and people don't even understand what trans is. Um, so we have to do so much more work to stop talking about us males to be honest, you, you know, um, like we are doing the work amongst male af 
athletes, and I think it's um, it's very typical, you know, of this patriarchic society that we're so focused on men, you know, that we're just for, for, forgetting that. So someone like a Pat Griffith, who's been who's been banging her her fist for years and years and years about talking about women's sports, and we we still aren't aren't doing it, um, and it just speaks to the idea that this is another male movement, un unfortunately. Lauren, I'd love to hear from you just the differences you felt in the college environment versus the professional environment. I know I've heard from a lot of female athletes and having played college myself that that college environment, for women especially being my experience, can be really oppressive. Did, was there any difference for you between Stanford and the Olympic team or your pro team now? I think there were differences between every single one of those situations for me. I think the college environment was full of fear for me. Um, and there were some very positive things that came out of that too when I actually did come out to some teammates who, you know, were very, very accepting, surprisingly accepting of me. And, um, but day to day, hour by hour, at every practice I, I did, it, it was, it was a fear. It dictated how I behaved in certain environments. Um, and then going on to the, the Olympic team and, and being in that environment just within our team, not the whole Olympic movement, but um, within our team, that's, like I said earlier, it's where I, I really figured myself out and figured out, okay, people do accept this, straight and gay people, and it's gonna be okay. But then, on the flip side, there's all this added pressure because it's my, it's my lifelong goal and dream is to be in that moment to make that team. I know one of my mom's big concerns was how it would affect me being selected to that team. There are plenty of amazing softball players in this country. If, give them one reason to knock you off that list and let's not even go there. And so that, that weighed on me heavily in my Olympic experience as well as that's when, you know, money comes in a little bit too and you have to consider that and endorsement contracts and things like that and obviously they're much less lucrative for women than they are men but man when they're much less lucrative you're scratching and clawing to, to mm -hmm. hold on to every last penny you can and um, to give them a reason to not select me to that team was something that I thought about often and then in the in the pro environment now I'm out so like I'm surprised that when someone asks me if I have a boyfriend or a husband and I'm like Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> haven't dealt with this in a while, you know, right. so I have to answer that question. <laughs> but um, so my experience now is, is a professional athlete is much different. And in, in, the, in our pro league, it's, it's whatever. No one cares. My teammates, some, most of my best friends on my team are straight. And they talk to me about my relationships just like we talk about theirs. And, and it's much different than uh, the college experience and very similar to the Olympic experience other than the, the pressure involved with making that team and then representing mm -hmm. your country and so many other things. Yeah. Billy, I'd love to hear your take on how the media handles these issues. Maybe that's a little self-serving, but <laughs> <laughs> what advice do you have for how the media has handled it? Or, or do you feel good about how the media has handled it in the last couple of years as we've seen this spike in stories about these issues? I think uh, the media, especially ESPN, uh, there's the baseball, uh, Buster Olney and, and um, Boog Shambi and John Shambi, some of these guys have really, um, and Bob Lee has been great for, I'm sure he's been good to you as well, but for me for 12 years, um, the show Outside the Lines, I, this is where I think we're seeing the most uh, progress in support for fairness for all athletes, male or female, to come out you know like you said that the, there is the the desire to find that first guy who has to deal with it day in and day out in front of the fans in Shea Stadium or Yankee Stadium or Chicago or whatever you know that's I think f the, the the entire movement will become more of a focus once that first person proves that they it can be done but definitely um, the media is ready for it. It just seems like now the way that social media affects the, the reputation, the personality, um, the popularity from minute to minute for these athletes, it almost seems like it might have been easier for someone in our era that was comfortable with themselves mm -hmm. to say, hey, this is who I am and this is what I'm, you know, I'm a, I belong here. Maybe someone who is in a more secure financial contract situation where the, you know, a team, whatever. But 
I think the, the media um, is by, you know, far and away a little more intellectual than, than where you see the, the, the racist fan or the, the homophobic fan. Um, it's, they're usually, you know, in the bigger cities or something where it just, the, there's so much more diversity. It's a day in and day out thing. And so um, I know from my experience, after my story came out, the people that come to me to ask me to talk about, and I have literally been on the sidelines watching from him to John Amici to Jason Collins to, um, you know, there, just, there hasn't been that many. Um, there seems to be more and more in the, in the college level, which is great. And they're not household names, but they might be where they're playing on the basketball team in Illinois or, or wherever. Um, you know, it's interesting to know, has it happened on the USC campus yet? You know, or something where you would think this is one of the most liberal-minded, you know, evolved universities in the world just based on geography and, and the Stop affluent sucking nature. Up, no, it's true. <laughs> the affluent nature of who gets to go here, you know, how much it costs the athletes that they pull in. But it's still, there's just, it's just human nature, the pressure. So, but to answer the question quickly, I think, I think the media is making it better for an athlete sees what the media is saying, and that's not part of the problem. Definitely. Agreed. Wait or uh, eat. Well, um, I, I would like just to add, um, um, back when I played or when we played, you know, anytime somebody would lash out and call somebody a fag, a queer, a whore, you know, uh, you know and, and use it in a negative term, it would be kind of like shoved under the rug. Now, I think the media has done a better job where as if somebody like Chris Culliver uh, who lashed out and said he didn't, you know, they don't, there's no fags on his team or he doesn't go like that or whatever. I mean, he plays for San Francisco, right? Um, I think the media did, a, I mean, they do a fantastic job of highlighting that. And for him to do it on the most important day of media, you know, <laughs> at the Super Bowl, it kind of put the issues on the table for all of us to discuss. And uh, I think it's our job along with a lot of the leaders in, in the audience uh, and you guys is to keep that discussion open and, and let's move forward from that. Uh, so it's, it definitely, the media has definitely um, have, um, had been a good support. I mean, I mean, we still, there's a lot more that we that need to do, but it's, you know. It, it, it's it interesting how the media, when, um, when John Amici came out t was when Tim Hardaway went off and he was at the All-Star Game uh, weekend for the NBA. And when Jason came out, that's why that question was posed to the San Francisco 49ers player and the timing. And I wondered if that reporter knew who kind of who he was talking to. And, you know, it's his story. You know, there's, and now, and what that does is it teaches uh, teams to tell the players to just keep their mouths closed, whatever your personal opinions are. You know what I mean? I mean, mm -hmm. I mean the stereotype of San Francisco is not quite fair because a player doesn't come from the, the city he's playing well, for. I know that. that so, okay. But <laughs> Duh. he should have an uh, open mind about it because right, of the community. Right, okay. Right. But, um, you know, what was, uh, in 07, I believe, or 06, I was asked um, to go and speak at the Rookie Symposium which was absolutely amazing. 300 athletes, one stupid question, right? Uh, I have no idea why they didn't ask me back, so I probably didn't do a great job. <laughs> but, but I thought, uh, uh, the reason why I'm bringing that up is that what the, the stupid question was, and I'm gonna tell you the stupid question, uh, was, oh, so if you're a fag, and I call you a fag, is that offensive? Uh, I was about to like rush him and jump over the table and do a little body slam, no, I'm just kidding. But you know what happened is that I looked around the room and every, all the other players were looking at this guy and they were saying like, are you an idiot? Like saying it out loud, dude, are you kidding me? So it was such an amazing uh, feeling to, to see that, you know, the reaction of the other players. So then when, when, um, when it was done, a lot of them came up to me and, and telling me that, you know, we do, he does not speak for all of us, which for me was very encouraging to see. And, um, um, and ever since it's been a struggle for me to get back because I have no idea. But, um, but I'll also, get back. Yeah. I'll make sure it happens. <laughs> what, what usually, remember when John Rocker went crazy and went to his Sports Illustrated article? Yep. Usually something good comes from a bad situation that it, the media and the way we work, it's no different than a catastrophe of the Hurricane Katrina or whatever. It's a different topic altogether. But there is a sort of a rallying. Um, thing that happens when that news is confronted with people that it is a casual subject to. 
You know, that whatever percentage of people don't care about LGBT issues, when they see someone full of venom and hatred, unprovoked, and young, and have the world is so kind to them, and they have everything, and they're still so angry and full of it's, and it, it's shocking. And so, and no one's life was affected more or worsely than John Rocker's. His career went straight down, and he was not. I mean, this is what I mean. What it's like to 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 be. He was marginalized. He brought that on upon himself. I knew a lot of guys in Atlanta Braves. That was my era, um, and they simply did not want to be around this guy. Because he was, you know, hot-headed. He thought that made him cool, and he was a feared reliever. The whole reputation, and he was attacking, and he never was able to, you know, coexist with the league. And he lost literally a hundred million dollars in potential long-term contract money, which, by that one hunting trip where he let a Sports Illustrated writer follow him around, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, yeah, it's so true that these events or moments when you think they're negative right. with Chris Culliver, you end up having conversations that you wouldn't have if it didn't happen. Um, we're gonna open up the questions in one minute, but wait, I wanted to ask you, if you're having a conversation with an athlete who's talking to you about coming out, what's your advice to them? What do you say to them? Um, my first piece of advice is to find someone in your life that's a support system. You know, find one person who you can have this conversation with because the last thing that you, you want is to go through this alone. Um, I went through it alone. It, it sounds like all, all of us did. And for me, the, the, the most unsafe place was alone. You know, when I was with my teammates or on the football field, I was the most happy because I didn't think about it ever. So my, uh, my advice is, is, is to always find, this, find one person who you can, can confide in, have that conversation with, and if things go, go bad, that's a person who you can fall back on to at least say, hey, this happened, can you su support me here? I would love if any questions from the audience for any of these folks. Yeah, right here. Did, you, did any of you guys um, ever have like teammates that maybe knew and you could find support within them or maybe you just didn't even question you in regards to it because they just had an understanding of you as a person while you were playing? Yeah, if you can. Uh, on. No, I, well, I didn't. I didn't have anyone. But you know, there was always those moments where you thought that you could trust a friend, and <laughs> and then this homophobic thing would you know he would say these you know come out come out of his mouth or something that he would do it, it just made me push that child further and further into the closet so but I you know I, I had little moments where I thought I could trust someone but um, but I, I didn't I didn't I didn't have anyone I could confirm. and it's an important point you make because I think within women's sports especially there's this idea that there's all of these allies that already exist and I know Pat talks about this a lot we've had a lot of male support strong allies stepping forward and starting movements and, and within women's sports you're like where are our strong female allies and I mean I know Lauren you've experienced that like with some of your teammates like are, is there a willingness do they do, do they assume that everybody thinks they're already an ally I think that there's some of that but I, I think that more so it's it's the stereotype that we've been talking about that's inherent with female sports and I, I have a, a few good friends of mine, very, very, I would consider them best friends who are straight, who are unwilling to speak out as a straight ally. Just don't even want to get involved with it, you know? And mm -hmm. um, I have others who are obviously much more willing, but I think that that's part of it. They don't, you know, they don't want to offend their family if they're outwardly supporting or, you know, I, I support you in your life and you're my best friend, but I don't feel comfortable speaking publicly about it. So I think that there's a, a lot of that fear like or just acceptance of themselves as a friend of a gay rather than being able to like take charge and speak out about it. Were you going to say something Just to else? answer his question, I'm sorry. Um, I do have friends that play in the NFL who um, some of their teammates know that they're gay. Um, and the one great thing about this ex existing now is athletes oftentimes protect each other. You know, um, they understand that he doesn't want to be known to be out, and he's just allowed to exist. Um, his partner comes to games every every now and then. Um, they don't say say anything. Um, from from what he's 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 told me, one of the other players said, "Hey, as long as you don't make it a big deal, I don't make it a big deal. I'm gonna make make fun of you. I'm gonna treat you the same as I 
as I always ways, ways have. And to speak to the comment about um, no straight allies, I think it goes back to, again, that we're not doing enough work around female sports to make sure that straight um, allies feel safe enough to come out and say, hey, I, I support you, I love you. Um, I think from talking to other female athletes, they feel as if they have to over-sexualize them, themselves to prove the opposite. So there's something that we're missing, Pat, that I need to do more of, so teach me. <laughs> Well, well, I gotta I ask a follow-up uh, question here as the media member. What's keeping this football player from coming out? Is it branding? Is it teammates? What's what's the thing? He's just not ready. You know, um, just to speak for myself. I hated myself so much for being gay that it wouldn't have mattered if someone said, "We'll give you a million dollars." I just wasn't ready. You know, to um, to be that naked. Um, and and from, from talking to him, he's just not ready either. You know, he also doesn't want to be known as the gay athlete. He just wants to be an athlete. You know, from the time he was young, he's like, I just want to be an athlete. You know, I don't I don't want that brand of being gay too. You know, I just want to be an athlete who happens to be gay. Any other questions? I mean, that's amazing to tell you. I mean, that's um, what one of my biggest like depression stages of my life was that I um, I couldn't share my partner with any of my teammates. Um, I went to the Super Bowl in 98, and let me tell you, that was the most amazing feeling. It was, it was bittersweet. It was sweet because I got to the Super Bowl and not a lot of players go to the Super Bowl, you know, playing in the NFL. But the bitter part of it, but the bitter part of it was watching all these um, wives and kids and parents walk into the, the, um, the hotel room, introducing, their, introducing them to the team, to the coach, and here's my partner, um, I call him my baby's daddy because we have kids together, and he's walking and he passes me. Uh, he passes me, and it's like, give him the signal of like, meet me in the room. So that was probably the most hardest thing for me is because I couldn't share the person that I gave my heart to, to anybody. And that really was very difficult. And I mean, women, if you're married to an a NFL player and you couldn't do that, right? I mean, it's like, hell no, right? <laughs> I mean, and we lost the game that we were supposed to win, right? We lost the game we were supposed to win. So everybody's getting, I was in the back of the bus. And we're getting off the bus, and all the wives are rushing the bus, hugging their uh, husbands and all that. And of course, I walk by and I say, you know, give them the signal, meet me in the room. So it was a bittersweet thing. But it, I mean, it's very. Man, I wish I, I can't bring that back, right? I can't take, bring back those memories. Yeah, I wear the ring, but yet it's like it doesn't mean anything because we really couldn't enjoy it. So. Any other questions? <clears throat> right here in the middle. Yeah. So we're talking a little bit about branding, and um, Lauren's even talking about like scraping for endorsements a little bit. And on Tuesday, I uh, hear we were talking a little bit about how maybe coming out would be even positive, like lucratively for endorsements, because people are going to flock to you. Have you experienced that at all, or has it been negative, has it been positive, like what's that change in like? Um, not negative, not positive, it's just been kind of non-existent, I think. Um, well, it, I came out at a time when softball was voted, it was the last Olympics for softball. So our entire sport experienced a complete non-existence of endorsement contracts. Not complete, but for the most part, it, it completely changed the landscape of our sport and our, and our professional and Olympic level athletes as far as endorsements go. So I'm not sure that my experience coming out um, is indicative of what it could have been, maybe two Olympics before that. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure. It hasn't affected me either way, though. I mean, I can speak a little bit to, uh, I did the cover story on Brittany Griner, who yes. stepped forward, you know, number one draft pick, right at the beginning of her career, which we haven't seen before. And I, you know, she's not taking a hit when it comes to marketing and branding. And there are companies who see that, like, Words like authenticity and inclusion are buzzwords right now, and that's where the movement is going. And I don't, I don't think from a branding standpoint, from some of the athletes I've spoken to, that it's that it's the reason they're not coming out. Okay, well, she's the best basketball player in the world. That's why she's getting the endorsements. That, the unique side of that, she's so good that that's a plus. But if she was not the best basketball player in the world, it would be it would be an issue. She's not only you, looks unique and beautiful and every encompasses every i mean i'm very close to the people at nike they are in love with this girl okay and she deserves it but it that the the people it, it was an issue it was it was a conversation at the beginning should we or because 
you're you're pushing into the fan base. I think people. Are you seeing a conversation at the beginning of, of, be, of whether Britney's it, or career? not to put their whole world behind her? You know what I mean? Endorsers, and, endorse right? it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if Nike is the top of the. That's it. That's that's for any athlete if you're there, and it's a, it's a great great accomplishment for all of us. But even her own coach. Was, remember she quoted that her coach told her to stay in the closet while she was at Baylor? Oh, absolutely. The crazy. college environment being yeah. so different. So, and she went to Baylor University in the South, whatever. But um, what I think a lot of people, uh, to answer your question, misinterpret attention does not mean endorsement money, okay? Like, so if you are an athlete and you are out of the, first of all, the big endorsement dollars usually come from the top male athletes in the world, whether it's you know track and field or tennis or golf or where the you know like individual sports push. So you'd have to be at the top of of, of whatever sport you're in. You know that's why the Olympic endorsement is such a because the potential for a decathlete you know or the you know the fastest man in the world or something like that like that would really bust the barrier down overnight. You know what I mean? Because their sexual orientation, you, it doesn't matter if you're, you're the baddest ass dude in the world at your sport, you know what I mean? People want to be connected to that. So I just think that uh, Jason, I think, would tell you, Jason Collins, that all the attention that he has received, it's, you know, Twitter followers and Facebook likes and all this stuff, but the dollar going into his pocket, and it's not translating in that way. Martina Navratilova is patient zero, example zero of that her being the best in the world at something and it taking 15 years of the people watching her be a really perfect citizen before it all came back to her. And it was almost like an homage to her career. You know what I mean? She was controversial. She, they should have never left her, you know, because she was the best player in the world. And so it's, it's interesting and I, I just think that attention does not equal money and it's easy for someone to project Oh my God! Everybody loves gay people. They would be so rich. You know what I mean? If behind, when you're talking about pushing merchandise, look at Tiger Woods' fall from the top of the mountain of endorsements to a marital dispute or infidelity, and everybody getting rid of him overnight. It took him three years to stop spinning, you know, and to maybe get back to, you know, just a, that little tweak. It's. It's uh, it's easy to generalize, but it's. it's well, I would say, I mean, with, in Britney's case, when you say, well, she's the best player, I mean, you look at Maya Moore, or I mean, or Diana Taurasi, they, they're not getting these deals. So I think there is something about Britney where she is existing in this zeitgeist moment for her. Yeah, it's not all about her coming out and being gay. It's no, also no, it's, her, it's, it's also it's her, her fashion look, and her that look. She can dunk that she's. But the best female players in the world don't get marketing deals. Yeah. You know, that's not something that just happens just because they're the best. Um, oh, you do? Unfortunately, Sorry. I know that I have another class coming in and the what? class period is over. So we have to unfortunately end here. Um, but I want to thank again Kate for moderating. And yeah, thank you, everybody.